Welcome back to Church-Based Marketplace Ministry. We're so glad that you're able to join us for this session, and this is a particularly exciting session as we look at the call to work. And of course, understanding what our call is and how we find uh, that calling and that, and that place, that sense of God's Spirit guiding us in the places where He has given us to work. I'm not sure what it's like in your particular situation, but in, in many of the places where I've been, Pastors are, are looked upon to, to provide a lot of insight and guidance in many different areas. And so I want to start this session by telling you a story of three people who made an appointment with their pastor for some career advice. The first person went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I think I want to be a lawyer. And the pastor said, good choice. God is a God of justice and you will join him in helping people find justice and, and to help justice prevail in the land. The second person said, Pastor, I'm thinking about becoming a doctor. And the pastor said, again, that's a very good choice. God is the great physician, and you will join him in bringing healing to people as they battle different diseases and sicknesses. The third person was a little bit shy, and the pastor had to encourage them and said, and what fine choice of career are, are you looking to do? And the person said somewhat hesitantly, Pastor, I think I want to start a business. And the pastor at this scratched his head and he said, and that is what we actually want to answer in this particular session, what should a pastor say to somebody who wants to start a business? Why would God want someone to go into business? What aspect of, of who he is, the characteristics of God, does a business include? And so we want to understand in this session from God's perspective, what is the purpose of business? And so in my time in, in talking with people and, and interviewing people and, and asking the average person, why do we work? I hear a, a number of answers that, that become a bit of a theme. You hear some, some same am answers as, as it relates to this question. The first most popular answer that we get is the reason why we work is to make money because there are things that we need to buy. We need food on the table. We need clothing. We need shelter. And so we work in order to get those things that we need for survival. The second reason that I often hear is, is that we are working to stay busy because God has told us to work. And so we are doing that to stay busy and to, to keep ourselves active. The third is that we do it for self-identity needs, and, and so we become to identify ourselves by the work that we do. And, and so when we introduce ourselves, we will give our name, and, and very quickly we will often say, I am a teacher, or I am a welder, or I am a mechanic. And so it helps us to define ourselves in, in terms of who we are. And of course, another reason we give is that sometimes we are working just so that someday we don't have to work. And you will hear people say, uh, I have eight years before I retire, or I have 12 years to when I retire. And so we're working so that someday we don't have to work. And I think one of the saddest things that we hear is that sometimes people say we work because of the curse. And we are seeing uh, that that work is, is something that came as a result of the fall. And I hope by now that you have seen that's not the case, that we were called to work. We were created to work in Genesis 1 and 2 before the fall happened. And so the working is not part of the curse. But most of these answers that you've heard so far to, to put food on the table, to stay busy, self-identity, those are all about me. And, and so the purpose that I often find that Christians give for why they work centers around self. And that was not God's original intention. And so we want to ask, what if there is more to work? And more importantly, from God's perspective, what is the purpose for our work? Well, one of the things we've been talking about is, is the three great directives. And the first great directive is the great commitment where God has committed the earth to us. And we, in turn, are committed to be fruitful, to multiply, to fill, to reign, and to subdue the earth. And so we work as a means of helping uh, to fulfill that call. And what that means is we are taking all the resources that God has given and, and we are, are helping to be image bearers of God who is a creative working God. And we are helping to create things that will help people flourish in this world. We are image bearers. And, and I don't know about you, but when I think about myself as an image bearer of God, I, I imagine looking in a mirror. And sometimes when I look in the mirror, I of course see my own reflection, but I never get confused as to what is the original and what is the image. 
But as it relates to being an image bearer of God, I frequently get confused and I frequently forget that I am to re be reflecting uh, who God is and I'd rather I get caught up in myself. And so when I work, God expects me to be an image bearer of, of his and not just work for myself, but I work to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth to make this world a better place and to help people flourish. Another reason for why I work is to reveal his power and his glory. Now, with almost 8 billion people in the world, we, we see that the world is just doing amazing things, and the world is changing so quickly. It was 100 years ago that, that we were barely getting around in automobiles, and, and now we're flying everywhere, and the internet is everywhere, and, and we've really become a global village. And some of that is a reflection. Most of that is a reflection of God's power and his glory. Those people who have created these things uh, may not recognize that they are doing things in God's image and that they are fulfilling characteristics of a creative God, but they are because every person is an image bearer. Well, another reason for why we work is to bring that kingdom of heaven on earth. And, and we know when we say the Lord's Prayer, and often when we pray, we end up, God ends up saying to us, yes, I agree with you for what you are asking, and I want you to go and do it. And so when we say in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, we are not asking for that bread to magically appear, but rather we are asking that God would give us the ability to work to be able to make that bread. And before that, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so there again, we are not asking God to, to make that happen magically through a miracle, but rather we are saying, let us be part of that process and, and use us to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. We can see in this that, that God is, is asking us to be part of the restoration, that, that Christ has redeemed all th things, but we are, are to help to fulfill that. To, we, we are not just simply in a waiting room for heaven, but we are to be doing the work that he has called us to do, that he has gifted us to do, to make this world a better place, to, to help this world to flourish as according to Genesis 1.28 and Genesis 2.15. Because in Luke 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And what was lost was three things. In Genesis 3, we know our relationship with God was broken. We know our relationship to each other was broken. And in Genesis 3, we see that our relationship to creation and to work was also broken. But Christ has redeemed those things. And so we need to change the way we think about work and recognize that from God's perspective, work was the reason that we were created. Work was the reason that we were put on this earth. And we are to take those things that God has given and help them to be the best that they can be, the best representation of the creator. And so we want to, to be able to work in order to, to help people and to help creation flourish. And so we want to ask the question, what is our call to creation? We've been talking about the Great Commission, and, and we know that we usually reference Matthew 28 when we, when we think about the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. But the similar verse in Mark is Mark 16, verse 15, where, where Mark is quoting Jesus in a slightly different way. And he says, where that Jesus' words were, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. What does that mean, to, to, create, to proclaim the gospel to the whole creation? Does it mean that we are to go out to our, our crops and to, to tell them to confess their sins and, and uh, to receive Jesus as their Savior? Of course, that would be a pretty foolish thing to do. So we have to remind ourselves of what God's relationship is to creation. Genesis 9 is a great chapter for looking at that. And Genesis 9 is, is when God reestablishes the covenant with Noah. And over in that, in that chapter, we see at least five different times that God is, referenced, God is referring to the covenant. And the covenant is not just between God and people to Noah and his family. But over and over in chapter 9, we hear that the covenant is being established with all living creatures and with creation itself because God cares about creation. God loves his people, but he also loves his creation. He declared it all together to be very good. And so we too are to, to take that and to understand that that covenant 
through us is extended to creation in what we do. But we also know from Romans 8 that creation itself is groaning uh, as in the pains of childbirth. And, and we know that creation is groaning because of our sin and, and because how we have chosen to treat the earth and, and the lack of care that we have shown it. We, we, we know throughout scripture that, that while God cares for creation, creation also understands God. Creation understands worship. And we see that in different parts of scripture. And we even see that with Jesus, that he had an intimate relationship with nature. He would speak to a storm and it would stop. He would speak to a tree and it might wither and die in front of him. And in fact, when the Pharisees were complaining about the people being too loud as, as, as Jesus was around them, Jesus' words to them in Luke 19 verse 40 were, I tell you, if these rocks were silent... If, I'm sorry, if these people were silent, the very rocks would cry out. Creation understands worship, and creation worships God. And it is up to us to help creation to worship even better. I love Psalm 96, verses 11 through 12 for, through, for this, because Psalm 96 describes creation worshiping God. In fact, it says, let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. Have you ever seen a jubilant field? What does a jubilant field look like? What does it mean that all the trees of the forest sing for joy? Well, let's look at that in just a minute, but let's also take a look at Isaiah 35, verses 1 and 2, which says that the desert and parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. Can you imagine that? A, a flower that is blooming, that it is, it is bursting into bloom. It's rejoicing greatly. It's shouting for joy. Creation understands worship, and God has put us on this earth to help us understand how to help creation worship. And so in your workbook, you will see some pictures. And, and the first picture I want you to look at is, is the picture of the maze. And what you'll see is, is that there, are, there is maize that is being destroyed by the army worm. And then you will also see a picture of maize, of corn, that is growing to the full potential that it can be. And so we want to say, can maize glorify God? And we think that it can. We believe that as we help maize grow to its full potential with, 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 with uh, ears of corn that we can enjoy and eat that nourish our bodies and fuel ourselves and they fuel animals and, and they can grow to such great heights that those corn fields, those maize fields are jubilant fields. When you see a, 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 a maize field that has got the army worm attacking it, you look at it and you can see that those are plants that are under distress. There is stress that is happening there. They cannot be all that God created them to be. And so we want to ask the question, who preaches to the maize? We believe it's the farmer that is preaching to the maize. That farmer is taking this gift of maize that God has given us and helping it be the best that it can be so that it is achieving the worship that, that it was intended to achieve and it can achieve what God intended it to be, which was a source of nutrition and food and energy for people. Next in your book, you will see a picture, two pictures of sinks. One is, is a very clean and beautiful sink, and the other is a sink that, that looks very dirty. And uh, who made the sink? God did not make the sinks. Mankind made the sink, and, but we made the sinks from those materials that God put on this earth. And so what is the purpose of a sink? The purpose of a sink is for us to wash our hands, for us to, to be clean and to be free from germs and to have good hygiene. And so the purpose of a sink is very important. And without a sink, without being able to wash, we may be spreading disease and infection uh, as well. And so who preaches to the sink? The sink that is dirty, I think I would be afraid to wash my hands there because I might walk away with more germs than I'm able to get, uh, get rid of. But the sink that is clean is a place that that sink can do its job. And so the person who cleans the sink is the person who preaches to it. 
who helps that sink be the best that it can be for the purpose of those who are coming to wash their hands so that they can be clean and healthy and go on with the work that God has for them in that day. The third picture is a picture of two bedrooms. And, and uh, of course, we want to ask the question, can a bedroom reflect the glory of God? And, of course, we know that, that sleep is very important. Um, God is the only one who doesn't slumber or sleep. And so our need for sleep is a reminder that we are not God. But the other reason is that uh, sleep is very important is because that's when our brain does the house cleaning that needs to be done. And so sometimes I hear of, of people who are being told by, uh, in a church or by a pastor that, you know, don't waste your time with sleeping, you should be up praying. And while prayer is very important, that house cleaning in your brain is also very important. And so getting good sleep is important for us. In fact, if you don't get enough sleep, what happens is the next day you get up and you feel cloudy. Uh, and it's like the house cleaning hasn't all been done and, and you needed more sleep in order to feel as alert and as prepared as you can be for the things that will face you in that day. So sleeping is important. And, and the bed uh, that, that's there that's kind of torn up in, in your workbook, you see the picture. I'm not sure I would get a lot of sleep on that bed. But the other bedroom looks like it's been well cared for and, and I would be able to sleep there so that I could go about my, my work the next day. And so who preaches to the bedroom? Well, it's the person that owns the bedroom or the person that cleans the bedroom that keeps it in such a way that it can do what it was designed to do, which is to help us sleep so that we can do the work that God has called us to do. And so we want to remember that we are to preach to creation in and through our work, to whatever it is that God has allowed us to do or, or has called us into doing, that we are to do that to the best of the ability so that it also is able to worship God. A tree gives glory and praise to God by, by being a tree. And we read in the Psalms that, or in Isaiah that, that the, the trees of the fields are clapping their hands. If we cut that tree down, it doesn't stop to worship God. If we create a chair or a bed, it continu continues to worship because it is now doing what people need done in order for us to live the life that we, that we are living. If I take a tree and I fashion a violin out of it and somebody plays that violin beautifully and it becomes a, a song of worship to God, that tree continues to live in its worship as well. And so workers are to worship God in and through the work of creation. Theologian Jeremy Bigby says that humans are called to articulate creation's praise. We help creation praise God by how we use creation, by how we help creation be a very good reflection of the creator. Dorothy Sayers in a book called Letters to a Diminished Church said this, Work is not primarily a thing one does to live but the thing that one lives to do. It is, or it should be, the full expression of the worker's faculties, the thing in which he finds spiritual and mental and bodily satisfaction, and the medium in which he offers himself to God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? It, it's, it's how we offer so ourselves to God is through our work. And we don't just work as a, as a means of survival. It's not just what we do in order to live, but it should be what we live to do. That was how God created us. That was the purpose, Genesis 1 and 2, before the fall. The fall complicated it, but it did not erase that work is good and that work is, is an expression of how we offer ourselves to God. It's what we do as an act of worship. And so part of being made in God's image means that we reflect an aspect of who he is. We re reflect an aspect of God's character. And as I have met and worked with business people and met and worked with pastors, I know that there's a difference. When I ask a pastor, how, can you tell me the story of how you felt called to become a pastor? They're able to tell me that story. But when I ask business people the same question, how did you feel called to go into business? I often hear them say, I'm not sure that I felt called into business. I just kind of ended up there. And so I want to take us through this, this chart, and this chart is in your workbook, where we're going to look at six different characteristics of God and where it is that our work fits into that. 
And I hope that you can identify that maybe you stumbled into the work that you were doing or, or maybe you, you did some discernment of what some needs were and, and, you, and you went into business in that way. But what you are doing, if it is a good business that is helping the flourishing of people, is that you are helping to fulfill a characteristic of who God is. And so the first characteristic that we see is that God is a redemptive God. And some of us are engaged in, in helping people to understand about the redemptive nature of who God is and, and his saving and his reconciling actions. And some of those, those jobs might be those who are pastors, those who are counselors, those who are peacemakers. Maybe you're a writer and you, you write books about who God is or, or you write poems or maybe you write songs. Maybe you're an artist that helps to, help, uh, to, to design things in a way that help people understand uh, the, that God is a redemptive God. And so wherever you are, and if you are in a class together, I would love for you to, to raise your hand or to stand up if you are involved in God's redemptive work. And we want to give a round of applause and say thank you for being involved in God's redemptive work. The next is that we know God is a creative God. And some of us are called to, to take the world that God has given us and to fashion new things from it, things that will help people to flourish and, and to be able to grow in their capacity uh, of, of using nature, of using what God has given and, and creating things like fans and like chairs and like, like cars and all, all these different things that we enjoy. And so people who are involved in God's creative work might include interior designers or metal workers or carpenters, builders, fashion designers, architects, novelists, urban planners, and so many more. If you are involved in God's creative work, which means that you are taking things from this world and you're putting them together to create other things that people can use and enjoy, then I would love for you to raise your hand or stand up and we want to applaud you and thank you for your creative work that you are doing. The next characteristic is that God is a providential God and, and God is all about providing for his children. In fact, 8 billion people in the world and we continue to find new things in this world that, that God has placed there because he continues to provide for his children. And so maybe you are involved in, in being God's hands and, and feet in terms of providing for people and, and helping to sustain humans and creation. And so in this list of jobs, we would see shopkeepers and farmers, repairmen, entrepreneurs, mechanics, janitors, those who are involved in keeping the economic and the political order working. And so if you are involved in God's providential work, in fulfilling the aspect of God being a providential God, I would ask for you to stand up or to raise your hand, and we want to give you a round of applause and thank you for the providential work that you are doing. The next one is that God is a God of justice, and, and some of us are involved in, in helping to fulfill the justice work that, that God expects to see in, in and among his people. And that would include those of us who are judges or are lawyers, who are city managers. Maybe we're prison wardens or we are prison guards or we are police officers. And so if you are involved in God's justice work and helping to bring justice on this earth, I would like you to raise your hand or stand and we want to thank you for your work in bringing God's justice in this world. The next one is that God is a compassionate God, and, and some of us are involved in that compassionate work, and that would include comforting and healing and guiding. And some of the jobs that, that are involved, the, the work that is involved in, in being involved in God's compassionate work are doctors and nurses, are paramedics and therapists social workers, pharmacists, community workers, nonprofit workers. If you are a homemaker, you are staying at home, you are a parent and you are raising children, you are a caregiver, you are involved in God's compassionate work. And so if you are involved in comforting, healing and guiding people, then please stand up and we want to thank you for being involved in God's compassionate work. Lastly, we know that God is a revelatory God. He reveals himself through nature. And some of us are, are helping to, to show who God is and, and, and to enlighten the world with the truth of who God is. And this would include, include those jobs that are, that are teachers and that are preachers, 
that are scientists, that are journalists, that are writers, those people that shine a light on a particular area that help us understand who God is and this world that he created. And so if you are involved in God's revelatory work, I would ask that you stand or raise your hand and we want to thank you for the work that you are doing. And what I hope that, at, that you see at this point in time is that, that you are involved in one of these six characteristics because this captures most of the things that we are involved in doing. And, and what you are doing is a good and a holy thing and, and you are helping to fulfill an aspect of who God is and the characteristics that, that we get to fulfill as co-creators with him. Remembering that we are not employees, but we are our co-creators. We are called to be co-laborers, and we are here to help fulfill an aspect of who God is. We are called to help bring that kingdom of heaven on earth a little bit at a time. And so one of the ways that we want to understand the work that we do as we look at the call to work is that we are to do our work as an act of worship. In the Hebrew language, in biblical times, the Hebrew language had about 8,000 words and at root words, and many of those words had multiple meanings because there were so few words. We can compare that at least to English, and we know that the English language, language has 150,000 words. And so you can see that, that they had to be very economical with their words, or they did in, in the, the biblical times in Hebrew. And where we see that is in the word avodah. Avodah is a word that has three different meanings from Hebrew to English. And those three meanings are service, work, and worship. And so it's very interesting to think about this word avodah, which meant both service and work as well as worship. And what we find is that in biblical times, in early times, there was no separation of work and worship, that everything was done as an act of worship. Today, if I ask people what is worship, we tend to have reduced worship to the songs that we sing on Sundays. We have worship songs, and in our churches we say it's time to worship. But in biblical times, there was no saying it's time to worship because everything was done as an act of worship. And we have moved away from that. We have reduced our worship time to something that is very narrow and very small. And I believe the Bible is reminding us and God is reminding us and calling us back to understand that our work is to be an act of worship, that we are to do our work with that same sense of joy that we have when we worship God and we feel that we are in his presence. And so on Monday mornings when I get up and I, I look at the things that I have to do and, and some of the things I love doing and, and they, they are life-giving, I, I get energy from them. And other things on my calendar are things that I don't love to do so much, but it doesn't matter because when I get up on Monday morning, I say, yes, I get to worship today. And we're reminded of Colossians 3.23, which, which tells us that we are to do our work as unto the Lord and not for man. And that is where we need to keep our eye, that, that we are to do our work as if we have an audience of one before us and we do it for him. And so we take our, our eyes off of ourselves. that narrow view that I'm working only for the money. Is, it's way too small. We work as if we are, are working for God. We do our work as an act of worship. And as we do that, people are blessed by it. People flourish by the work that we do, no matter where we do it, whether we are cleaning floors and helping things to be cleaner so that we can be healthy. That is an act of worship. Whether we are repairing things that are broken so that people can continue doing what, what God has called them to do, that is, can be done as an act of worship whether we are taking care of children, whether we are sewing clothes, all of these things can be done as an act of worship. When we remember that whatever you do, we work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. And so we come back to the beginning of this session where we thought, talked about those three young people who went to their pastor for their career advice. And if you remember, the first person went and said, Pastor, I want to be a lawyer. And the pastor said, good, that's a, you, God is a God of justice. You're fulfilling that aspect of who God is. And the second person said, Pastor, I want to be a doctor. And the pastor said, good, God is a great com, com, uh, physician, and you are entering into that compassionate work with him. 
But the third person said, Pastor, I think I want to start a business. And what we wondered was, what would God say to a person, or what would the pastor say to a person who wants to start a business? And hopefully, we are saying what God would say as well. And this is what we think the pastor should say. They would say this, you are considering a noble calling that will allow, that will involve you in delivering on key aspects of the great commitment from Genesis 1 and 2. As a Christian business person, you serve a hurting world by providing it with material goods and services that will enable it to prosper. You will hire people so that they can express their God-given identities through meaningful and creative work. In short, as a Christian in business, you provide the means that will enable your friends and your neighbors to flourish. Excellent choice. I hope that you hear that, that you hear that, that the work that we have to do is an excellent choice. And it doesn't matter where God has called you. When we do it as unto the Lord, he is able to redeem all things, to make them good. And when we do it as an offering of worship, that God is able to, to smile upon that and people will be able to grow and to benefit from that. So I thank you for your time in the session. I hope you feel encouraged in the work that you do. And uh, we will see you next time again. God bless you.